Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third meeting in PNS Modern SSDs. Today, we are going to discuss advanced NAND flash comments, which are essential to improve the performance in SSDs. And also, we are going to see address translation, which is, I mean, very important since as, as we don't have uh, in place. I mean, in-place updates are inefficient in SSEs, and we need to do out-of-place updates. We will see more later. So as a very quick recap, so we uh, learn about SSE organization, that we have SSE controller, which consists of multi-core CPUs, and we have pair channel flash controllers, which each uh, basically flash controllers is servicing uh, several NAND flash chips, which are connected to the same uh, channel. And we also have a DRAM in SSD, which is essentially used to store metadata uh, and also and for <clears throat> other usages like write buffer. So the capacity of this DRAM is usually 0.1% of SSD capacity. And uh, each SSD has several NAND flash chips, which uh, basically they are, uh, so several of them are connected to one channel. And uh, basically each NAND flash chip consists of several dies, each die has several planes, and then many blocks, each plane has many blocks, and then many, each block, many pages. Uh, we also see uh, NAND flash characteristics as uh, basically we need erase before write. Asymmetry in operation units, basically read and program happens in pages. And for erases, we have in block granularity and limited endurance in NAND flash chips and the retention loss that essentially we need to do refreshing at some point. And uh, we also uh, saw discuss basic NAND flash operations, how we can do read, program, and erase. We also basically discussed the uh, sensing secretary, the, the last meeting. So today, as I said, we are going to discuss advanced NAND flash comments and also address translations and garbage collection. So let's uh, first take a look at how we can uh, analyze SSD performance. <laughs> So one of the metrics is the latency or response time, which is the time delay until the request is returned. So the average read latency for a sample example SSD, which you can see the, uh, the link here, is uh, for four kilobyte pages is uh, 67 microsecond, and the average write latency is 47. You can see actually here that uh, write latency is faster than read, which is, I mean, if you, are aware of the program latency, you should know that basically write pro program latency is much higher than uh, read latency in flash chips. So the reason that write latency on average is quite faster than uh, read latency is that we can do writes in mostly in the write buffer. So basically SSDs can easily just acknowledge the host and, and write, write the data to the data and send the acknowledgement to the host. So yeah, this is the latency metric. We also have throughput metric, which is, uh, I mean, th this is the number of requests that can be serviced per unit time. Usually uh, people report throughputs as IOPS, which is input output operations per second. So for the read, random read throughput is up to uh, 500K IOPS and random write throughput is up to 480K IOPS. And for the bandwidths, Another metric that we have is the amount of data <clears throat> that can be accessed per unit time. So basically for the throughput, we don't know, I mean, we, we are cal calculating based on the request and requests can be in different sizes. So bandwidth is a more accurate metric because it's amount of data that can be accessed per unit time. So usually we uh, calculate bandwidth for sequential read uh, and sequential read and sequential write. So for the, for the uh, sequential read bandwidth, we can have up to uh, 3,500 megabytes per second. And for sequential write, we can have up to 3,300 megabytes per second. So as a comparison to, I mean, HDDs, we can see significant performance improvement for SSD. So for the latency, HDD is something around one to eight millisecond. And for throughput, HDDs are around 1K. And for the bandwidth is 100 megabytes per second. So you can see, I mean, when we are talking about the SSC that they are significantly increasing the performance is uh, basically these are the reasons. And uh, 
Another thing that we are going to see also later is uh, not in this lecture, but maybe later is about uh, the, the, the interface that SSDs, they are using NVMe interface to basically make sure that they can utilize such high bandwidths. So in order to basically measure the chip operation latency, we have also known as sensing data from the cells into the on-chip page buffer. So in your flash chip, when you want to read the data or a page, basically you have, uh, yeah, you have some uh, buffer that you need to, when you access, send a request, send a command to the flash chip to read the data, there is a latency that happened and you read your data in uh, flash chip and store in the buffer, which is inside the uh, flash chip. We also have a T program. So as soon as you have your data in that buffer inside the flash chip, you need to wait for T program such, such that your data has been uh, programmed in flash. And also we have T uh, BER, which is the latency of raising the cells, which is in the granularity of block. So these actually latency numbers or parameters, they, are, they vary depending on the um, MLC technology. Are we using SLC, MLC, TLC, QLC? and also the processing node and microarchitecture. So in example, 3D TLC NAND flash chip, TR is around 100 microsecond, T program is around 700 microsecond, and TBR is around three millisecond or five millisecond. Another important metric that uh, caused the, basically the throughput and affect the throughput and latency of accessing uh, SSDs is the IO rate which is the number of bits transferred via a single IO pin per unit time. So, as, so when you read your data uh, from flash chip to the, to the buffer that you have inside the flash chip, you need to communicate your data to the SSD controller. So this communication happened with the channel that we will see later also in this course. And this, usually this channel is considered as a, I mean, eight, uh, IO, eight uh, basically uh, lines. And uh, so the transfer happened in byte granularity. So imagine that basically your IO rate is one gigabit. Um, so, I mean, per one gigabit per, uh, per second. So uh, basically uh, when you want to transfer a 16 kilobyte page size, the transfer time, which is TDMA, uh, is gonna be some, something like 16 microsecond because so your page is 16 kilobytes and you can actually send uh, one byte in a cycle in a, let's say in one nanosecond because your transfer rate is one gigahertz. And then uh, basically, so for the, the, uh, the whole stuff, you need to send 16 K data, which in the end you would need, you need to wait for 16 microsecond. So this is also another important metric that uh, affect the performance of the, uh, your accesses. So now let's see basically uh, what is going to happen when you want to uh, read data I mean the, uh, from the flash chip. So we have this TR, T program, and TPER, and also we have some IO rate. So imagine that you want to basically read the data, uh, read a page, a 16 kilobyte page from a flash chip. So the first thing that you need to do is sending a comment to the NAND flash chip that basically you want to read a page from this physical address. And after sending T command, you need basically NAND flash chip is going to uh, prepare your data, your pre uh, requested page, which you need to wait for TR, the sensing time. And after that, you need to transfer the data TDMA to the flash controller or the SSD controller. And inside the flash controller, you first need to do ECC, ECC decoding to make sure that your data is correct or fix some errors if you can. And, uh, and then after that, basically, you need to de-randomize the data because you know that uh, we were talking in the previous lectures that when we want to write to the SSD, you usually randomize your data just to make sure that worst case patterns is not going to happen. So basically, after reading, you need to also de-randomize to make sure that, I mean, you have your actual data. So the latency, basically, the command latency is usually so negligible, but for TR is 100 microseconds. We have also, these are for TLC, I mean, sample TLC that we were uh, assumed. 
And TDMA is 16. ECC decoding is around uh, 20 uh, microsecond and randomization is, you can also consider negligible. So overall we have uh, uh, basically 130 second microsecond latency for read. And for program, basically what you need to do, first you need to randomize your data. When you receive your data, you need to randomize it. Then basically you need to do ECC encoding to calculate the, let's say parities. And then you need to basically flash control needs to send a command to the NAND flash chip. And this command is quite uh, basically, it's just, we are considering here as common just the write request with the address. But essentially the command for write is also, is both the address, the physical address and also the data. So we consider that data transfer in, in TDMA, that basically you need to also transfer your data that you want to write to the flash chip and then T program. So if you basically, uh, some of the, the main, the dominant one would be something around 730 second microsecond. So how about the bandwidth? So for the read, we are seeing that we can basically read 16 kilobyte in uh, 130 second microsecond. So overall the bandwidth is 120 megabyte per second. And for write is 16 kilobyte in uh, 730 second, which is 22 megabyte per second. So, but I mean, these numbers are different from the numbers that we saw before. So SSC read latency is around 60, uh, 67 microsecond, the bandwidth is much higher and also the same uh, for the right. So what would be the reason for that? Any idea? So for, for right, actually I uh, mentioned before that basically we can, we have a right buffer that can uh, essentially increase the bandwidth and, uh, and the, uh, performance significantly. And the same also for read, you can also utilize some parallelism that you have in SSDs. And uh, basically you can significantly, basically you are able to overlap some of these latencies. And also you can also uh, utilize the internal parallelism that you have in SSD to increase the bandwidth. And we are gonna see some of these basically optimizations in this course, in this uh, lecture basically. So as I said, we have, uh, high internal par parallelities in SSDs, and also we have a DRAM write buffer. Here, actually, I'm gonna also mention that DRAM SLC write buffer, because usually for TL Q TLC and uh, SSDs, because basically TLC is quite uh, slow, uh, people are using also SLC write buffer, which is, this is a, so for SLC write buffer, you can actually have a huge write buffer because you don't have the issue for the, uh, data integrity. So if something power cut happen, uh, you, you have your data in SLC right buffer. But for DRAM is not the case. So <clears throat> for DRAM, you need to add capacitors. So people are using also SLC uh, as a right buffer uh, also in uh, modern SSDs. Okay. So one of the uh, the, one of the basically optimization technique is that happening uh, for to handle these minimum IO units in modern file system. So you know that in modern IO, in mod, uh, modern file system like FTFS and AXT4 in uh, Linux, basically the, the 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 page size is four kilobyte. However, uh, modern SSDs they usually they are working on sixteen kilobyte pages. So when you are reading a page, when you have access for four kilobyte. So you're gonna read 16 kilobyte and this kind of, you know, unnecessarily that you need to read, send and transfer unnecessarily uh, extra 12 kilobyte of data. So one optimization that uh, is happening in modern SSDs is stop page sensing. So for example, it is uh, implemented in Micron and you can see the link here also as any uh, basic as one of the material for that. So basically it's possible that uh, you, when you request is four kilobyte, you can do sub page sensing. And because I mean, page, page in uh, modern SSD is usually 16 kilobyte, but you're also able to only uh, basically sense four kilobyte, which can significantly reduce the sensing time. And this needs some microarchitecture level optimization inside the NAT flash chip. And another optimization, which is also implemented in modern SSDs is random data out. So 
imagine that you read your data. If you don't also have this sub page sensing, you read uh, your data, you sense your data, and you have your 16 kilobyte of data in your inside the, the buffer inside the flash chip. But you don't need to transfer the whole 16 kilobyte to the SSC control or the flash controller. The, uh, basically, you can do some kind of random data uh, that data transfer with an arbitrary offset and size, which can significantly reduce the TDMA uh, for your data. So with these two sub page sensing and random data out, essentially what we can do is significantly, I mean, uh, uh, make sure that we don't uh, pay for the, the overhead for basically for uh, reading uh, low uh, accesses, basically four kilobyte accesses. Okay. Another optimization is cache read command. Let's see what is it. So. Basically, uh, the idea of cache read command is perform consecutive reads in a pipeline manner. So in uh, basically in, uh, conventional, let's say traditional SSDs, we were using, uh, when we have one read, I mean, to address A, we have this uh, sensing time, TR, and then we need to transfer uh, to the flash controller, and then we have this ECC uh, latency. So as soon as you have your basically uh, flash control receive your data in in the in flash controller and wants to do ECC ECC decoding, uh, basically you can start another read. So in uh, traditional SSDs or conventional, you can uh, basically overlap T ECC. But there are many. Uh, SSDs in the in the market now in the modern SSDs nowadays that they are, can actually also uh, make it possible that you overlap TDMA uh, also. So how is is it possible? Basically, is using another command which we call it cache read. So when you are sending a requesting uh, when you are sending a command to the flash ship, you are you send a command read A and also you send another command which is cache read B. So basically your flash ship knows that it needs to do read for uh, basically for page A, and also it needs to do um, read for page B a bit later. So as soon as uh, flash ship sends the data for A, page address A, and has it and, and have it ready inside the, in the, the buffer, it can start reading, sensing the B address also. Let's see here also with some example. So basically uh, you send a page read A and then uh, sensing and you have this inside your page buffer. And then basically as soon as uh, you have in your page buffer, the flash ship can start the TDMA and transferring page A to the flash controller. But in, in parallel also, it can start doing uh, sensing for the B address. So as a consequence for, in order to I mean, enable this, uh, technique, you have to provide enough page buffer spaces inside your NAND flash chip. So basically, it, uh, it comes at the price of additional on-chip page buffer, let's see. Any question? So yeah, with this cache read command, the benefit is that we can remove TDMA from the critical pass and it increases throughput and bandwidth and reduces effective latency because on overall, when you make an average latency, you can see that basically you have better, uh, lower latency on average. So I like to wait for a few seconds just to make sure there is no question. There is no question on YouTube and from Zoom. Okay, it seems no. Okay, so another, uh, operation that we actually covered it uh, briefly in the past also is multi-plane operations. So you can do concurrent operations on different planes in, in, a, in a NAND flash chip or NAND flash die. So we should, should recall that basically planes, they share word lines and uh, row, clone, uh, row and column decoders. So basically when you, when you want to target a page in a plane, you need to apply uh, V uh, reference to that page, right? To that word line. And uh, we need to apply V pass to other uh, word lines. 
So basically you can apply the same voltage to other planes and also we pass to also other planes. So this is an opportunity that planes can concurrently op operate, but the constraint is that we, you can do it only for the same operations on the same page offset, basically. You cannot, for example, do read and write. You can just do read the same operation and also on the same page offset, just to make sure that they are you know, uh, nicely aligned. This is the constraint. So the benefit of multiplane operations uh, is that basically you can increase the throughput and bandwidth. So almost linearly with the number of planes that concurrently operate. Let's see why is that. So the bandwidth with regular page program is uh, if you are programming 16 kilobytes, and you know that from the previous example that latency is 736 uh, microsecond. So the bandwidth is, is kind of uh, 22 megabyte per second. So the bandwidth is multi-plane page program when you want to uh, basically program two planes. So the data that you program is 32 kilobyte now, but for the latency, uh, you can overlap the program latency of these two planes. So when you want to calculate the total time, basically you, you just need to consider only one uh, program latency, but you need to add also TDMA because essentially you need to transfer 32 kilobytes of data and you need to consider that also. And also the ECC. Uh, so overall, you can see that basically the bandwidth is now 41.5 kind of megabyte per second. So it's, I mean, uh, roughly two times higher. But so the reason here is that basically the majority for write, usually uh, the majority, the, uh, the, the dominant factor for the latency is the basically program latency and uh, transfer and ECC other these things are not let's say the dominant uh, factor but there are also some SSDs that they are performance optimized SSDs that for those SSD we can see actually that uh, TDMA can be uh, can be actually dominant factor too so this is the, the case for the TLC and the example that we were discussing but overall, uh, basically, multi-plane operation can increase the throughput. But you should also consider, uh, note that that per operation latency increases. I mean, if you only consider the program latency that you had before for a 16 kilobyte of page, and now for that specific, uh, let's say, uh, operation, you need to spend more time. Why is that? Basically, you need to transfer all these uh, programs, uh, I mean, pages that you want to program in parallel. So basically, essentially the multi-plane page program is number of plane times ECC plus TDMA. So this is the something that you need to times by the number of plane, and then you can have T program. So for per operation latency, you can see that you have increased, but overall on average, you can improve performance. And basically the benefits highly depend on the access patterns and FDS data placement. So basically, FDL uh, and should do its best uh, to to make sure to utilize these uh, multi-plane operations. How the FDL does the placement and how also issues requests to the flash sheets. It's really important to make sure that we can utilize multi-plane. And sometimes it actually is not easy and to do that because of the random data accesses that you have in the system. Okay. Yeah, and another uh, optimization is program and array suspensions. So you know that read performance is often more important. There are two reasons. Basically, writes can be done in asynchronous manner using buffers. So whenever you have write, you can mostly you can write that write inside the write buffer, and immediately we can send the acknowledgement to the to the host system. And uh, basically read requests are usually on the critical path of the performance of the whole system. So uh, we, we really like to basically make sure that read performance are good. So, but basically sometimes we have, uh, you, cannot, you cannot basically uh, write your data inside the page buffer and you need to basically uh, write it to the flash sheet and also your flash sheet, maybe the flash, the corresponding flash sheet that you want to read a page from that might be busy because of the uh, arrays happening. 
So we have a kind of you know latency asymmetry here. So consider that PA read is just a hundred microseconds, but here I mean the arrays can be five milliseconds. So the worst case chip level read latency can be 50 times longer than the best case latency. So this is something that uh, I mean we should look into it to fix. And uh, the way that uh, people are doing that, in I mean, I'm not sure actually if it is completely implemented in modern SSDs, but at least there are many uh, researchers in academia that they are doing that. Is they are suspend ongoing program and arrays operation once a read arrives. So imagine we have this. Uh, let's say, uh, I mean, you have you are doing a program which is gonna happen 700 microseconds. As soon as, I mean, after 100 uh, microseconds uh, since you start your program, you receive another read uh, request. But this read request needs to wait for uh, an, uh, another 600 microseconds just to get so, such that that program uh, finish and then you can, the flash chip can service read. But the thing is that if you can uh, suspend the program, so, so for the, you, you program for 100 microseconds, then you suspend and you service read, and then you continue your program latency. So overall, you can see the, the total latency is a seed 100 microsecond, not different. But the difference here is that for the uh, program latency, previously, the latency was 700, but now is 800. But read latency previously was uh, 700, but now is 100. So you can see the overall, uh, Huge improvement happened here because of the, because basically you are scheduling those requests that they can uh, happen faster. Uh, I mean, uh, first. So th this is also some uh, scheduling technique which is happening in, in in OS also. OS there's usually programs and processes that they can be done quicker. You, you I mean, OS uh, usually prioritize them in the in the workload schedule. So yeah, it significantly decreases the latency, but as a, there are some issues also. So you need additional page buffer again here for data to program. Just make sure that because you suspend your data, your program, you just make sure that you have a buffer such that you don't uh, miss your data. And it actually can complicate, it, uh, complicate all your scheduling because until when we can suspend ongoing program requests because it can also cause some uh, issues like the uh, basically uh, starvation can happen. So there is actually, uh, we will have a lecture on IO scheduling uh, and how we can ensure fairness and high performance in IO scheduling later in our course. But you can have the sense here also, basically we can see that uh, suspension can improve the performance, but at some point you also need to finish your program uh, latency. You need to uh, finish your program uh, request. Okay, and also it has negative impact on the endurance because you suspend the program and you need to continue it later on. I mean, people uh, showed in uh, researchers that it has some negative impact, impact on the endurance because it actually it increased the number of program and arrays. Okay. So, as a quick summary, we saw about, we talked about sub page sensing and random data out, which is very good for IO unit mismatch between OS and NAND flash memory. We also observed the cache read command that we can basically overlap TECC and TDMA with their uh, sensing uh, time. And also we, uh, we talked about multi-plane operations, which you can increase the throughput, but operating uh, on different planes at the same time and uh, the program and array suspensions that you can suspend your ongoing arrays of programs so that you can uh, basically address the read uh, request as soon as possible. So any questions up to now? Okay. So now let's uh, discuss about address translation and garbage collection. So as we discussed uh, before, also in uh, SSD, we have SSD firmware, which uh, people also, I mean, it's also known as uh, FTL. So 
basically it provides backward compatibility with traditional HDDs and also it hides unique characteristics of NAND flash memory to make sure that the overall system is simple and overall system uh, should not deal with, I mean, characteristics of the NAND flash chips. So basically this FDL uh, is responsible for many important SSD management tasks. One of them is address translation plus garbage collection that we are gonna see today. And the very leveling uh, to prolong SSC. Each and hot by doing a lot of write and erase, program and erase, and some others are cold. So this where leveling is really important. And data refreshing, which is to make sure that you, because of the retention uh, error that you have, you need to do refresh. So this is also uh, part of the responsibility of FDA to check and do refreshing. And IO scheduling, which we also see. I mean, these are some of the, uh, the same important tasks of FDA, but there are also some others that... So our goal is to cover all of these, uh, let's say, uh, character, I mean, operations in FDL uh, later in our course. But today, we are, on a, we are gonna see address translation and garbage collection. So consider a simple SSC architecture. So you have a storage view at the operating system level, a flat block device that basically, yeah, in here, consider you have 16 uh, blocks and each block is four kilobytes. So you call it, each of these uh, is logical block address. And inside the SSC, we have physical block address and we have physical page address. And you can see that basically, uh, so at the, at the host level, we had 16 blocks, but here we have, uh, in SSD, we have 20. So it's kind of over provisioning. So physical capacity is usually uh, larger than logical capacity in SSDs. And this is uh, mostly for performance and lifetime. You will see uh, soon that why it's really important to do that. So imagine that you want to uh, write uh, as a request, you want to write to a basically logical block address zero. So FDA receives a request which uh, the, the address is logical block address zero. The size is one. So you want to just write one page or one uh, four kilobyte and the direction is right and the data is A. So basically FTL uh, and imagine the basically all of these uh, pages are free now. I mean, the beginning, we are in the complete initial state. So firmware FTL uh, picks one of the uh, free uh, pages, which can be basically in block zero and page zero and writes the data A. So here we are assuming that logical block size and physical pace are, are equal. But as we discussed uh, in the past, I mean, a few minutes ago also, that logical block size is usually four kilobyte. I mean, not usually, I mean, modern file system is four kilobyte, but physical pace size is most of the modern SSCs, they are in 16 kilobyte. So you have kind of mismatch here. We will see later in the in the later lectures that how we can handle this fine grain mapping. But for now, for simplicity, we consider that uh, these two are completely in the same size. So you basically you pick uh, this uh, physical page address zero in block zero, and you write the data A. Later on, uh, FTA receives another request that wants to write in logical block address four. The size is twelve. So we want to write on 12 pages and uh, basically the data, which is from B to M, for example. So here, basically you can assume, I mean, maybe you can expect that uh, if uh, FDL is gonna pick block one, block two and block three, and it starts uh, programming data from basically physical page address four, because it is, I mean, similar to this one, four. And uh, yeah. Um, until this 12, address uh, 12. But, I'm um, sorry, until uh, this uh, 15. But the thing is that uh, this is not happening. And uh, FTL is basically keeps writing to first use block zero and writes 
make sure that you use all the free pages in block zero and it goes to block one and block two and block three later. So the reason is doing that is uh, basically for active block uh, issue. Basically, we should have should keep only one block being written. I mean, it can be a bit more also, but there shouldn't be many, let's say, open blocks or active block at the same time because so because of the reliability issue. So when you have an open block, it's not going to be reliable for those data that you have been programmed before. So they may have uh, they may actually experience more retention time. So the, uh, for this problem, uh, FTL is doing its best to make sure that all of these. Uh, so the, the block which is active, which is open, we want to uh, to write uh, pages to it as soon as possible. And another issue is that we should make sure that we keep the program sequence constant. So we, we cannot, for example, program uh, page, let's say three in block zero, page three, and then page one. We should keep the, the, the program sequence. That's also because we have cell to cell interference. And uh, if you don't, uh, I mean, consider that you, you may have issues some, you may have uh, induced some errors to already program data. So these are the basically recommendations from the uh, from the, in, in the data sheet of NAND flash chips that basically you should uh, do that to make sure that you can use your NAND flash chip in a reliable manner. So now uh, the problem is that you can see some mismatch. So the logical block address is uh, four for B, but the physical address is one. So basically, they don't they don't match, and we need to. So when in the in, later on, if you receive a read request to logical block address four, you don't you should uh, basically figure out where is the physical page address for that. And for that, we need to maintain address mapping information. So there is a table inside the DRAM buffer uh, that we uh, have. We keep the mapping table, the logical to physical mapping. So for this. We know that, for example, we keep the mapping uh, information that logical page address four is mapped to physical page address one. And with that, you send the request to physical page address one and you read your data. OK. So imagine that you receive an update in your logical block address zero that previously it has I. Uh, um, the data was A, and now you want to uh, write a new data, which is A prime. So FTL picks another free page, which is here, uh, physical page address 13, as an example, and writes the data A prime. And then we need to update the mapping table. We need to basically do two things. We should make sure we should invalidate the, the previous copy of this data in this uh, logical block address. So this is going to be invalid. And then we uh, need to update the mapping table. So logical page address 0 is now mapped to physical page address 13. So future read, if happened to this address, we need to access the 13 uh, physical page address. So imagine you receive more updates to this uh, basically uh, logical block address. And you keep basically doing invalid <coughs> invalidating and uh, writing to new uh, free pages. And at some point, you can see that we are running out of free pages. And that's the thing that basically in SSCs, usually we have kind of you know over provisioning to make sure that basically we have more space and we have more freedom to handle these uh, you know, the out of place updates. But in the end, it's going to just, it can delay uh, you know, the, the need for something that we are going to see soon. I mean, the garbage collection. But but it's good that I mean uh, you can improve performance by that also. But at some point you are running out of free pages and you need to reclaim uh, free pages, and that's the job for garbage collection. So we need to reclaim free pages by erasing invalid pages. So the erase unit, as you know, is block. So if a victim block to erase has valid pages because they can also have some valid pages, all the valid pages need to be copied to other free pages. This means that you basically, is, in order to be efficient, you shouldn't uh, start garbage collection once you're completely run out of free pages. So you should have a kind of threshold that and, uh, and a strategy that, okay, 
once we have, uh, you know, we are using, we already use many of the pages and we don't have enough number of free pages, we should invoke uh, garbage collection. So there, there are also some, uh, you know, the research on that also. So, so as I said, all the valid pages need to be copied to other free pages. And the performance overhead is that basically you need to read these free pages, uh, sorry, the uh, valid uh, pages, and then you need to program them inside other uh, in free, other free pages. So, I mean, if you also, I mean, ignore all other latency like the TDMA latency and also the ECC latency, you need to basically at least pay for this T read plus T program times the number of valid pages. And you can imagine that it's actually huge latency. And that's the one of the reason that garbage collection is quite uh, costly. And this is also have a lifetime overhead because it's gonna cause additional rights that you, you have this PE cycle increase. And this is something that people call, call it as right amplification. So the number of rights that you're sending to your SSC is a number, consider that, I mean, I don't know, 1K your rights you're sending to your SSC, but Internally in your SSC, basically the number of writes is higher than that. And one of the reason is actually this uh, garbage collection and uh, that you need to basically move data internally and write them to other places. So one policy, you can have actually have different policy for garbage collection to select which block, uh, to select the victim block. But one way is using greedy victim selection policy. So we will see also other policy, at least one more policy in uh, future lectures. But in greedy victim selection policy, basically we erase the block uh, with the largest number of invalid pages. So basically you greedy select a block that has largest number of invalid pages. And the key idea here is that basically that uh, block has the, most of the pages are invalid and you don't need to pay a lot for reading and writing basically valid pages to uh, other uh, SSC locations. So in order to implement greedy victim selection policy, you need to maintain the number of invalid or valid pages for each block. So then we have another table inside the FTL, which we call it status table. And for each physical block address, you keep the status. And this status for each, I mean, physical pages inside that physical block address, you have this uh, basically, it can be either invalid or valid or even free. So when, when a page is free, it means that you can easily, I mean, use that to write. And when it is valid, it means that it has the up-to-date, the most up-to-date copy of a logical address. And basically when it is invalid, it means that uh, the, the, the data that you have in that, uh, physical page address is obsolete. So by checking this status table, you can pick the one that has largest number of invalid pages. Here as an example is physical block address three. And then you need to basically uh, make sure you copy uh, the, the, the valid, the, the only one valid page here to, uh, to, the, to a free page. So you need to read physical page address 12 and you need to basically program it to physical page address 17, for example, here, because it's free. And then the whole block tree is gonna be invalid. And you also need to update the status table for block four because it's now it has uh, two valid and two free pages. And also you, then you need to also update the mapping table. So previously, uh, this physical page address 12 was mapped to logical uh, page address 15. But now you should basically make sure that this logical page address 15 is mapped to 17. But now it's a question, basically how FDL knows that physical page address 12 uh, or data M is mapped to logical page address 15? Because I mean, this mapping table is uh, the opposite way. So when you have the logical page address, you can basically uh, query this mapping table and realize the physical page address. But when you have the physical page address, basically 
unless you maintain the physical to logical mapping, you cannot uh, realize that which, what was the logical page address for them. So in SSC, usually physical to logical uh, mapping is stored in, a, each, in each physical pages out of bound area. So as we discussed also in the past, uh, I guess in the first lecture or second lecture, I don't remember exactly, but we had, a, we, we, uh, we say that basically uh, the size of page in each flash page is not exactly page size. So when your page size is 16 kilobyte, you have some more also flash cells in that page. And those flash cells are used to store basically parities for ECC, for example, and also some more information like physical to logical mapping. So basically we keep the logical address there also that this physical space is mapped to which logical uh, space. So with that information, you can also update the mapping table. And then basically you can erase the block tree. And then you can update the status for block tree that all pages are free. Here is also, we need to make sure, uh, I mean, it's important to uh, note that uh, block eraser and a status update, they are just uh, happen before programming a new page to the block, which we call it lazy erase. So whenever you make sure that the block is invalid, I mean, all the pages are invalid, you don't immediately erase it unless you have an active write request that you want to service. You just basically, you wait. And at some point when you have some uh, active write request, you're gonna erase your block because this is exactly due to the open block problem that we also see uh, we have, we've seen before. So you don't want to when you erase a block, you make it open and it's ready to program. So basically, it's not good to keep a block for a long time open. So to in order to deal with this issue, we uh, use lazy arrays. Okay, so now let's uh, take a look more detail in performance issues or garbage collection. So as we discussed, garbage collection significantly affects SSC performance. It has high latency because of, so large, in modern NAND flash memory, we have large block sizes. Assume a block contains 576 pages that can actually, uh, from the previous example, and imagine that just, 5% of the pages in the victim block are valid. So, and for the number of the read and program, you can also reuse the, what we had before. So the number of pages to copy is uh, 576 times 5%, which is overall you need to uh, basically copy 28 pages. So the GC latency would be at, uh, at least uh, 28 times TR plus T program, plus uh, the basically the erase time, which is uh, around, uh, I mean, you can see it's 27,400 uh, microseconds. So, or 27 milliseconds. So you can see that actually the order of magnitude larger than this latency is order of orders of magnitude larger than TR and T program. And basically copy operation are usually the major contributor. So TBER is five milliseconds, but only, I mean, uh, 22 milliseconds of this GC latency is just because of the copy. And uh, yeah, basically uh, you should make sure that you are reducing the copy latency and also make sure that you are doing copy in a, uh, let's say, uh, efficient way. So from this analysis, you can actually uh, feel I guess you can better understand that why greedy uh, selection policy that we see that we select victim block, that block that has the highest number of invalid uh, pages. Why is that? I mean, why it's good? So you want to make sure that you reduce these huge copy latencies. And if FTL performs GC in an atomic manner, and what does it mean by atomic? Which means that when FTL is doing GC, it cannot service anything else. So. This is completely in atomic. It delays user requests for a significantly long time. And it has long tail latency, which is uh, happening as a performance fluctuation. So if you, for, uh, I mean, traditional SSC, if you uh, make a, I mean, observe the latency of your 
request, you can see that as your requests are servicing a good time. But as soon as you have this uh, garbage collection invocation, you can see the performance significantly drops. And this, uh, so if your requests are, let's say, are not lucky, and they happen when GC operation is happening, you will uh, basically experience a lot latency, which you can consider as a tail latency. And this is also another problem, which uh, because of the noisy neighbor, that a read dominant workload performance would be significantly affected when running with the right intensive workload, which is, I mean, the performance fairness problem. We will also uh, see in that the lecture of bioscheduling that how we can at least uh, handle these issues from the scheduling part. But uh, apart also, you need to make sure that you are doing garbage collection in a better way. So uh, yeah, quickly see also the performance, how we can mitigate these issues. So there are uh, several techniques. One very important technique is trim or on map or discard command. So this command is uh, basically implemented inside the file system. And uh, inform so whenever you, for example, remove a file uh, from your OS, just you remove it. So mostly it happens on the metadata in the file system. And basically uh, SSD internally does not know that your data, I mean, has been removed. And uh, since you don't also update that address anymore, SSE is gonna basically consider it as valid. And uh, whenever it wants to do a uh, garbage collection, it needs to basically copy that valid pages. And you can see that although you already remove your data, SSE is doing garbage collection and moving and, and paying for the copy of that data a lot. So in order to make sure that we don't have this problem, whenever you remove the basically file, OS, I mean, modern OS, they inform FTL by using trim command that basically this address, this file is deleted or deallocation of a logical block. And this, it allows FTL to skip copy of absolute or invalid data. So basically FTL can consider that data as invalid because I mean, you already informed that I don't need it anymore. So this command is really important to reduce the overhead of copy. Another uh, way is uh, important thing is to do background GC. So basically you exploit SSC idle time. Whenever your SSC is in idle time, you are doing GC. So the, this uh, is to make sure that basically your GC operation is not interfering with other operations like read and program. So basically, I mean, one important challenge is how to accurately predict SSC idle time, which actually there are many works in the literature that they are doing that by using uh, different uh, heuristic technique or even machine learning based techniques to accurately, I mean, uh, with some good accuracy, I would say, uh, estimate the idle time in SSDs. And another issue with this background GC is that you may do some premature GC. So you copy some pages that could have been invalidated by the host system because you are not doing GC at, at the right, uh, right time. You may actually miss some of the opportunity that you can have. Because I mean, some data that you're copying may not be needed copy to be to be copied because um, later on you may, you may have some stream coming, for example. And another uh, important, let's say, uh, optimization is progressive GC, which uh, would uh, basically is already implemented in uh, modern SSDs, that you basically divide GC process into subtasks. So. Whenever, so when you want to, for example, copy 28 pages using our previous example, you copy one page and you service user request. And this happening, I mean, kind of, you know, 28 times, and it's really effective at decreasing tail latency. And because of actually this progressive GC trim command and also background GC, if you profile the performance of SS, modern SSD these days, you can see that basically you're, you don't see a significant fluctuation in your read latency. Actually, yeah, GC still has some performance issues, but it's not the, the fact that, I mean, your performance significantly drop when GC invocation happens. So yeah, that's the thing. Okay, any questions? Okay, so if there is no question, I guess we are kind of done. So. Uh, there are some required materials regarding address mapping, uh, DFTL, which is actually one of the old paper in this direction. So 
this is a very important paper to take a look because uh, basically in the past, uh, people are using uh, mostly uh, block-based mapping just to make sure that the mapping uh, table data is not uh, huge because I mean, when you're keeping the mapping information for each page, you, are, you need a, a larger mapping table. And this, this is exactly what we assumed in, the, like, in this lecture. But in the past, because I mean, the overhead of mapping table was not, uh, people couldn't, uh, let's say, tolerate. optimized SSDs, they were using a block-based mapping table. But then later on, there was a, a work that's named, I mean, DFDA, that shows that basically if you use a page a mapping table and you use the DRAM buffer as a kind of cache to cache your basically um, mapping table information, you can still have the performance of keeping page uh, mapping table inside the DRAM. So this is actually a very interesting uh, paper to take a look. And also for cache read and read, read write, I would suggest that you check the paper in uh, our uh, from our group in S plus 2021. Uh, and for program and array suspension, there are also some papers that you can see here and you can read and uh, learn more. Okay, so yeah, if there is no questions, I guess we can wrap up today's meeting. I would wait for a few seconds just to make sure there's no questions. Okay, then, uh, thanks a lot for attending today's lecture. And uh, uh, so next week on Friday is a holiday, but uh, we, are, we will uh, discuss and probably we may also, we may uh, premiere some lectures for, uh, for the next week. But we will uh, basically inform and update the schedule in our course. So yeah, uh, have a nice weekend and uh, see you all next time.